right, good evening, everyone. We are experimenting a little bit tonight. We've had pew packers, and uh, that was pre-recorded, and now we're doing uh, a Facebook Live where Blake and I are going to talk a little bit about securing spiritual success for our young people. Uh, and so this was something we had planned on doing live in front of the congregation on a Sunday night. We'd had this uh, planned all year, and uh, because of COVID, we're not meeting on Sunday night now we're in a situation where uh, we're doing it virtually. And I right. thought that it would might, might be good to do it live. Yeah. I mean, I, I see we've got some people, you know, tuning in and hopefully we get some others and, you know, feel free to make a comment or even ask a question and we'll try to keep up. I don't so know if we can. It's, it's kind of like the, the matrix here because we're watching ourselves <laughs> like a minute in history or in the past. So it'll be a little confusing, but we'll try to track with it and if, it you is. Have, if you have comments that are pertinent or, or maybe even questions at some point, we might be able to kind we of respond to, to some of those depending on how this goes. Yeah, we're kind of watching you here on my phone <laughs> to see what the comments and stuff are, but you're behind, so we're trying to do our best here. So thank you for tuning in. We're talking about, uh, I think we titled this Rise Up, and just talking about how we can do a better job as parents securing the spiritual success of our children. I do want to make this disclaimer, though, before we go any further. Neither one of us claim to be an expert in anything, much less parenting. Um, but I, I think this discussion will be helpful to, to us, me and you, but also hopefully to everybody else. Um, we're coming from two different angles here. Yeah, I've raised kids. Now, I'm not saying I raised them well, but I raised kids. And you are in the process. You have just gotten started in raising kids, right? Say, so, well, I had your kids and you raised them well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and but yeah, parenting is, parenting is no joke. It's some tough stuff, and uh, so on this side of things, I have a different type of respect for what my parents went through. Sure. And so any of those watching who knew me as a young person have, <laughs> Don't a, lot hold of, that against me. have a lot of sympathy for them. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of funny. We were, we were talking earlier, and um, I see a bunch of these new parents with the newborns talking about school and all mm -hmm. of that. Well, now Brianna and I have a kindergartner, and all of a sudden we're the experts on what right. it's like to have a kid in school. And so... You hear all of these ideas from those who haven't been there, and you think, you know, just wait. When you're in, when you're in our shoes, it's a lot harder than it seems. Right. And so I kind of temper everything that we're about to talk about tonight with this reality that I haven't ever raised a teenager. Right. Um, and so I've worked with a lot of teenagers, love teenagers. Spend. The, I mean, I think that I bring some value to the discussion, but when it comes to actually parenting a teenager. I've never done it, and I am no replacement for the, the parents in the lives of these teenagers. So, if you are watching this and have a teenager, you know your teenager, you are the perfect person that God has put in their life to raise them, um, and so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I hope that it's helpful. Um, probably when it comes to parenting a teenager, you should listen to Chris more than me because he's been there. <laughs> I've been there. I can tell you some things to do that uh, I did that didn't work, you yeah. know. But we want to be positive in this too. Yeah, I think there's all too often the message from, you know, um, from the public in general, from preachers, whoever it may be, is, oh, we, we're doing it all wrong. We're losing our kids at an alarming rate. What we don't come back and say is, it's been my personal experience, and I think statistics would probably bear this out too, that, you know, a lot of young people that do leave come back, you know, or they find their way back. Uh, I also think that it's important to uh, preface our conversation with saying that um, we want to be optimistic. I, I, I don't want to sit here and be doom and gloom because um, I've, I've had a great experience with my own kids, but also with kids in the church uh, as a youth minister, as a minister. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of great, I mean, I go and speak at a lot of different places. We do the preacher training camp and uh, then we, we have kids here. And I can tell you that the church is in good hands. I mean, it's going to yeah. be okay. Um, I hate it that any person would fall away, child, adult, whoever, but uh, we're, we're going to be okay. We I got some so. good things going. You know, you know we, uh, I think sometimes we approach parenting as if it's this huge burden. Yeah. And, I, and uh, I mean, there's a reality there. It's a responsibility. Right. But I mean, children are also spoken of as a blessing in Scripture. Absolutely. And, and, and this, I mean, what we get to do as parents is a really cool thing. And there's a lot of blessings that come along with it. Um, there's a lot of hope that we see out there. Sure. In fact, I, I mean, I made a comment this morning when we were presenting Ella Rich's talent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what a testament to the reality that, I mean, we have kids. 
every day in a culture that is just just ripping at the foundation of Christianity, making the decision every day to follow Christ. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah. that's awesome. It and, is. and it's there it and, and we need to look for it more than we do. So I'm proud of our kids. Oldham Lane is also a special place. It is. Um, I agree. We have some really special parents, and so um, being part of that community is a is a huge plus. I think so. I think you said something uh, one time when we were talking about this that part of this comes down to at least a big part of raising kids is parents viewing themselves correctly. Absolutely. You know what did you mean by that? Okay. Um, well. I think here's what I, here's here's the heart at what I'm getting at. Yeah. Our kids follow suit with what they see from their parents. Sure. Okay. So we have this idea in our mind of how our kids need to be. So we view ourselves as this architect that's supposed to come in and and we've been given this child and we're supposed to shape them into this person. And sometimes we get so focused on that we forget that one of the more important things forming their character is the image that they see in us. Sure. I mean, we're the mirror that they are looking at. We are reflecting back to them what it means to be a Christian. Absolutely. You know, I've talked a lot about identity and belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been something that has been a part of my ministry, my thinking about ministry for quite a few years now. Sure. And, and those are core things, the core questions that our kids are asking. Yes. And they start really young. Yes. Who am I? Where do I fit? Yes. Um, as parents, we're providing the first, the first answer to that. Yeah, I like uh, it. You know what I mean? I mm-hmm. mean, who am I? Well, they're looking at me, and they're looking at you. Right. Your, your kids were looking at you, and my kids are looking at me to answer that. Yes. And so being sure, first and foremost, that we're where we need to be spiritually is one of the most formative, powerful things we can do in the life of our kids. Um, you know, we, we are a society that, um, how would I say it, we, we kind of um, hire out a lot of the task in outsource. our lives. Yes. Yeah, we outsource a yeah. lot of the task in our lives. Yeah. And so, if we're not real good at mowing the yard, we face someone to mow the yard. Right. You know, if, well, if, if we don't maybe, do it, <laughs> maybe I don't know how to change the tire on my truck, so I go to the tire shop and I have the flat exactly. fix. And and I mean, that's just kind of part of the society that we live in. Yes. Um, when it comes to the spiritual life of our kids, we can't outsource that. Yes. Um, we can't outsource this formation of their identity. I mean, we we have kids. This is a you know, hopefully. A 60-year conversation yes. that yeah. we're going to have with our children that's going to wax and wane as in the different stages, right. but is going to be a continual conversation. And, you know, I get seven years yeah. to interact with the teenagers during adolescence. Yes. It's a formative seven years, but I get seven years. Uh, that's nothing yeah. compared to what you're, you know, I got to be with, well, only five with, uh, with Zane and Zoe. Yeah. Yes. Only because because of when I took the job, um, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what you get with Zane and Zoe. But you can make a profound impact, and you have, you well, know, you can make a profound impact in that time. And that, and I think that was what was difficult for me. And by the way, your dad is watching. Uh-oh. He popped up, so we maybe we need to ask him about, you know, <laughs> how to raise okay, difficult so, kids. So first of all, <laughs> dad is not allowed to comment on the Facebook stream. <laughs> yeah, okay. he will be muted. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that was for me as a parent. You know, when they're before they start school, man, I'm the only interaction they have. I mean, I am it. Me and Libby, uh, their mom. That's the only interaction they have with with adults, basically. You know, besides, you know, some different areas like a Bible class at church and all that. Right. But then they start school. Suddenly, there's a big chunk of their day that is spent with someone else. Absolutely. And I was, I, w- I was very uh, at first. <laughs> I wouldn't say very, a little bit jealous of that because they'd come home tell me how great their teacher was and all that. And then I started thinking, no, that's what we want. We want them to have good influences besides us in their lives because I don't do everything right. There's things I don't see. And then they get into the youth group. That was a great influence. But it's also important because sometimes you have to shield them as well because some of those influences aren't great. And, you know, they get a they get a bad coach, which mine didn't. Thankfully, they had good coaches. But they get a bad coach or something, and then now all of a sudden you're having to, you know, make up for that. And so um, I think – Making sure that as the parent, 
as parents, you are the driving force in all this. And hopefully everyone else is just complimenting, yeah. you know, like at church, for instance, they go to Bible class. I mean, I, I want them to have great Bible class teachers that bring out things in the text that they've never seen before and all that. But I don't want them to be the only spiritual influence in their lives. Right. I, I'm to be the, the greatest in that. Right. And then everybody else is complimenting them, you know. Um, if I might kind of piggyback on some things that you said, there really is a, a seasonal nature yeah. we might say to our influence sure. in the life of our kids sure um and so while i hold the the parents are the primary influencers yeah. engaged in a 60 year long conversation sure um with their kids um there there are seasons where the influence is greater yes. and the influence is more absolutely so, i mean if i was kind of thinking graphically when when the kids are born there ain't much going on there. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? I mean, so not are you, are you influencing them? I don't know. I mean, people say you are, but I'm sorry. It's just not much. But, I mean, it just spikes so quickly. Right. And and they start learning and picking up on things. And like you said, you're it. That's it. I mean, it is you and only you, and their eyes are on you. And we have this spell when they're younger where your influence just skyrockets. I mean, it's off the chart. Yes. Um, but then as life goes on and depending on the kid at the different stages, right. um, you know, they, what a big, a big milestone is beginning school. Mm -hmm. And like you said, all of a sudden now there's a different voice speaking into our That's kids. Right. And so now instead of just maybe hearing us and the Bible school teachers here at church, yeah. they're hearing the voice of their teachers. Luckily, Braxton has Miss Bailey from here at Oldham Lane that's, teaching that's Braxton, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know he has a Christian voice there, and that's great. But he's hearing from his peers now differently sure. and all of the people who are interacting with him. And, and so we kind of start, I won't say handing off influence, but sharing yes. influence. Yeah. Um, and then something happens, maybe fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, it depends on the kid where all of a sudden mom and daddy's voice isn't very intelligent anymore. And yeah. you know what I mean? And, and there's, a, there's a period in the life of our teenagers, I think you could say, where, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying parents check out. They are still heavily influencing their kids. Yes. But, I mean, there's a period there where the kids aren't listening the same yeah. way that maybe they used to. And maybe listening to outside voices more. And so one of the things, one of the things I think we learn from realizing that, I actually want to speak just a second to the parents of our younger kids who are watching us. Yes, absolutely. Um, how important it is to put patterns in place when they're young yeah. and they are eager to listen to your voice to kind of help carry you through that sure. spell, um, to establish, and not just your voice, but establish relational patterns that are going to put them in contact with other Christians and especially Christian peers so that when they stop listening to your voice, the voices that are speaking into their lives yeah. that they are hearing yeah, that's good are point. ones that you want them to, to be heard. Yeah, it's a good point. So, so in fourth grade or fifth grade, being sure that your kids are plugged in to a Christian community is really important. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you might not think so. Man, in second grade, what does it matter? Oh, it matters a lot. Sure. Because sixth grade's coming, and then seventh grade, and then eighth grade. It's not and, getting easier. And yeah. you can put habits. I mean, we can we can work. We can start late and right. still influence our kids. It's sure. not hopeless. Right. But you're going to have a much easier time if you establish those patterns when they're young so that they can transition into those adolescent years yeah. with uh, different voices speaking into their lives. Absolutely. You know, you... Uh, Catechism, yeah, Catholic, Catholic, uh, mm -hmm. Catholic thing. I, I listened. I can't even remember who it was that was speaking, and he talked about the world mm -hmm. is catechizing our kids. In oh, other words, okay. systematically teaching yeah. our kids what culture wants them to be. Yes. So the world is saying, you know, they they hear our voice, they hear our voice, and then they go out to the into the school and to their friends, and culture starts saying. Okay, who am I? They ask the question, who am I? And sure. culture says, well, let me tell you who you are. Yeah. And, and what is culture saying to our kids 
and does it line up with what the Bible says about reality? Yeah. Not at all. Right. So culture says we're a product of evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no inherent value other than you're an atom, um, a mass of atoms, a mm -hmm. blob of cells. Um, culture, culture actually gives a pretty bleak outlook on life. Yeah, there is no hope there. No. Yeah. And they sell it by saying, hey, but this is fun. Yeah, live it up while you can. Yeah, live it up while you can. And, and our kids are hearing that message at every turn. Yes. And so recognizing that the importance of us starting young and like speaking a message that's counter to that. You know, putting them in relationship with people who are going to speak a message that's counter to that. Yes. Um, that's why, I mean, I believe youth ministry has a biblical and important place in, in the church. Yeah. Because I believe youth ministry is a structured way that we can deliberately be sure that we are speaking those truths to our kids during the period when they're kind of turning their back on, on some right. of what, you know, maybe not willing to listen to mom and dad as much. Well, we're filling the gap. We're bridging the gap. Sure. But it's temporary. It and, is. And it is. and it's only a small part right. of, of, of guiding them to where they need to be. Yeah, you know, you said something also the other day about the science of parenting. Okay, and the right. art of building oh, a child, yes, yes. you know? I don't know yes. if that was something you came up with on your own, but I mean... I don't I, come up with anything on my <laughs> well, own. So. I was sitting there, I was thinking about that, and I thought it's kind of like this COVID stuff. You know, there's the science behind it, and then there's the practicality. I don't want to get into all that, but I mean, I've heard people talking about the science of it, of a yeah. virus, and then, you know, kind of what it looks like in real life and all that. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what you were getting at, the science of parenting. You know, you can read all the books, and I'm not saying that's not, that's not a good idea, but at the end of the day, what it looks like in practicality sometimes is very different. And I can speak to that because I thought, you know, I, I remember when I was younger, I worked in the grocery store through college and these parents would come in with their kids and these kids would be, you know, a holy terror. They'd be throwing a fit. And I'd, I'd say to myself, my kid's never doing that. Right. And guess what my kid did? I can, all I can tell you. All of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, you know, when you think you have it all figured out is when you learn you don't have it all figured out. But um, talk a little bit about that, the science of parenting versus the art of building a child. So let me, let me draw from this. Okay. You, you know from being around me that I like I have all these hobbies that I'm usually pretty bad at. Well, one of <laughs> the hobbies that I'm terrible at is gardening. Okay? I wouldn't so say you're terrible at gardening. I'm terrible at gardening. Brianna, well, Brianna has told me on multiple times, just go buy some vegetables. <laughs> um, Be easier. But, you know, I... I've also spent a lot of time building things. Yeah. So I would I can go out in the shop, and if you wanted a desk, I'd build you a desk. It might not be great, but I can build you a desk. Yeah. And you get the raw materials, and you cut it to shape, and you put it together in the form that it's going to be, and oh, in the process, you construct this usable tool. Sure. Okay. So yeah. you have that process of creating. Yes. Then there's gardening. It's it's different. It is. It, yeah. You there's. There's still some inputs that are important. Um, the plants won't grow without certain inputs. Um, but, but also, you're not the one that's really ultimately responsible for crafting this object. This is a living being, and you are cultivating and providing an environment yeah. for this plant to thrive within. But you're not entirely in control of what it is and the final outcome and all that. Sure. I, I think parenting is a lot more like that. I would say okay. the science of building versus the science of gardening. Is there some science to it? Yeah. Absolutely. Are there some things that you can learn from reading books? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but at the end of the day, this is a partnership with the creator. Absolutely. Um, and, and you are tasked with cultivating this garden, and, and it's really an art more so than a science. Um, and, and knowing when to, when to trim something up a little bit. Sure. When the garden needs to be weeded and when it doesn't. Yeah. When it needs to be watered and when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when you need to have conversations and when you don't. And how you need to have those conversations. Sure. And, and so there really is much more nuanced than just saying X, Y, Z, 
outputs a Christian faithful job. Yeah. I mean, it, it just doesn't work like that. And there's not a one size fits all because every child is different. No. And, you know, that's, we were talking about this the other day, me and my wife, is you see various kids. You like, well, you know, like uh, you've talked many times about Braxton, your oldest, who's a kindergartner. And, you know, you've talked about how he knows better. He knows he's going to get whipped, and yet he does it anyway. And Libby and I were talking about that. You know, of course, we can think that's funny. You don't think it's funny in the moment. We're, we're sitting there kind of laughing because he's such a cute kid, and he's a great kid. All your kids are great kids. But, you know, you sit there and you think, why? You know you're going to get spanked for it. Why? You know you're going to get punished, if not spanked, if time out of where. Why do you do that? And, you know, we had a our, our middle child, Zoe. You know, she was always, um, you know, she would – she would kind of challenge a little bit more. Um, let me just say this: all three of my kids are great kids. I love them to death. I'm not. I'm not going to rake them over the coals tonight because I love them. They're great. They turned out wonderful. I won't let you, you know? rake them over the coals because yeah. I love them. Too. I, I love them. <laughs> I love them. But Zoe would admit that in, when she was little, we got the home videos to prove it. You know, she was <laughs> she was a little bit more challenging, and it's like they all have their unique personality. So there can't be a one size fits all. You've just got to a, a, kind of adapt and adjust. And as a coach, you know, I always felt like I could, I could save any kid or help any kid. And then you look around you, uh, one day and you kind of go, am I doing any of this right? I mean, you know, some days you think you are. And, and so I'm getting at is parenting kind of goes in waves. Some days you feel like it's really going well. Other days you feel like, golly, I, I, I just, I'm pulling my hair out. Um, so let's let's speak to that a little bit. I mean, the consistency of it. I, I think understanding that you know you just set the consistent example, the constant consistent example. I think I think there's just a you know sometimes they're going to follow it, sometimes they're going to disappoint you, but you keep setting that consistent example. I just wonder what you thought about that. I want to go to the text. Okay. Um, Every discussion about youth ministry, you have to read this first. So okay. That's a little... Uh, Deuteronomy 6? Deuteronomy yep. 6. Gotcha. But but seriously, yeah, there's a reason we read it. Right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. So, first of all, where the words set in us as parents matters. That's right. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give you with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of all good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Yeah. Man, I, I see that, and yeah, it's different for every kid. Yeah. But there are some principles, and if anything, if anything I see in that verse, it is consistency. He says, you talk about it, you talk about it, you talk about it. Yes. This is your heart. This is you. This is your identity. You are God's people. Right. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. And, you know, I was raised a Christian. My parents spoke this truth to me over the years. I'm working to speak it to my kids. Because if I don't, they seriously are going to have houses full of good things that they did not fill. Yeah. And, yeah. and vineyards and olive trees that they didn't plant. And they're going to eat and they're going to be full because they're going to experience the joy of Christian community growing up without any foundation to carry them on into the next generation. Yeah. And so so you get your cake and you eat it too, <laughs> right. except, except you really bend down a yeah. lot. Then, then you end up with a stomach ache yeah. because you've forgotten where it all came from. Absolutely. And, and so, I mean, I say that to say, consistency so many of us your generation my generation were brought up in spiritual households yeah um, we have to be cautious lest we become lax and forget yeah. and in the process of forgetting forget to bring our children along and recognize that I mean at some point they become accountable for their sins just like everyone and need right. forgiveness yeah, and, absolutely. and we have to we have to bring them into that and speak to that and talk to them about that. I mean, this is to the nation of Israel. We're not the nation of Israel, but there is a principle there sure. that I think matters, and it is, I mean, 
God as a people and his design is for us to speak often yes about the way that he blesses and interacts with his people and and I would say knowing what you can con- can control I mean like you said you, you have 18 years with them you know raising them yeah. know what you can control and uh, I I always say church attendance is a decision made one time right. you know we're not going to get to Saturday night and say, well, are we going in the morning? Of course, when I became a minister, that changed anyway. Right. But, you know, are we going to go on Sunday morning or are we not? Well, I don't know. We'll see. No, it was a decision made one time. Our kids never had to wonder. You know, even before I became a minister, you, you just you didn't have to wonder. We were going to be at church. So decision made one time. Um, I think also understanding that, um, you know, when you're under our household, we're going to model certain things. We're going to do certain things. We're going to have certain holy habits, if you will. We're going to study the Bible. We're going to have devotionals, those kind of things. And the older they get, the harder and harder that gets to do because you have all these different things going on in their world, whether it be band or you know homework or sports or whatever it is. But try to remain consistent and constant with it. But uh, know the things that you can, con- can control And because when they get older, you can't. I mean, you know, especially when they have their own kids and all that, you can't control as much as you'd like to. They may not do it the way you would do it, but being consistent and constant with those holy habits and those different things that you're doing. I mean, that's a, that's a theme I pick up on in a lot of my reading is the importance of ritual and habits in yeah. families. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of the reason maybe we worship the way we do it. We have a lot of traditions in we the do. way that we worship. We um, do. But, you know, those... Even if they're just traditions, they're important because they give us a sense of constancy and ritual and something to cling to and something familiar. Right. Um, our our kids are gonna remember and be shaped by these rituals and these patterns. People kind of a little bit harsh towards church attendance sometimes. I mean, it's yeah. like it's like you. It's like one way or the other. It's like I've got to be legalistic about being there, or then the other side is. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter. We need to back off. I mean, I would say that's an important habit sure. that that demonstrates over time to your kids, this is a priority. This is a priority. When I mean, you want to talk about speaking to it over and over again. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a habit that's important. It is. And and it keeps you it it's more than just a habit that's important. It keeps you relationally engaged with those who are gonna speak truth in a culture that doesn't. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I look at that. That's not the only one. But that's a really important one that I think parents may be getting weak on. Yes. Uh, I'm, I think we do a pretty good job here, but all in all, I think we've backed off a little bit on that for, for fear of being legalistic and too rigid. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important. Um, I think it is, too. I, 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 need, I need the kids. I want the kids here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want the kids here so that they can impact one another, so that they can have those relationships, so that we can have that teaching. But more than anything, because that pattern of healthy sure. involvement and relationships will carry into their future life if we establish Well, you said it right there, and I think that's where we get off track sometimes, is we emphasize the rule but not the relationship. Right. So why are you here? Why are we coming to church? Is it just so that we can be together and and follow all the rules and make sure that we did it correctly? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we're coming because we're celebrating the fact that we are a Christian. We're celebrating our God. We're we're celebrating the victory that we have and the hope of Jesus Christ. We're celebrating the fact that that we are the greatest social network that has ever been created. And we get to be together as a community of believers and, and, and be on the same page, reading from the same script, loving on one another. You know, when we emphasize that, too often, I think what you said is true, we get off track and we maybe don't emphasize this as much because we don't want to be too legalistic, and we're emphasizing the wrong thing anyway. Right. It's not church attendance. You're emphasizing right. we get to go worship right. because we are the people of God. Right. And I think all too often we emphasize the rules and not the relationship, or we emphasize yes. the ritual and not yes. the relationship, you yes. know. Um, Absolutely. I, I, fir- I firmly believe, and I've learned this the hard way as a parent, Every parent is teaching something. Always. You know, yeah, it's, you're never neutral. You're teaching something always. always. So the question is, what do you want to teach? What is it that you want to be teaching your kids? And we've got to make sure that we're, we're modeling for them. I think kids get their first impression of God from their parents. You know, And uh, that's, that's scary, but De- it's also a blessing. You know? Debbie McCoy. Uh-huh. When I, I remember a conversation with Debbie McCoy when 
we first had Braxton, and she made a comment about that. I'm sure I'd heard it before, but I, for some reason, yes. it was, I mean, I was a new dad, sure. and, and she made a comment about how their, their first view of God is going to be their, I mean, their view of you is yes. going to be their first, I can't remember how she phrased it, but their first kind of glimpse into what it means to have a father, yeah. a heavenly father. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. That's, I, I mean, that's a little scary. It is, um, but but it's but it's important that we model that for our kids. So and always appreciating the urgency because I, I didn't always appreciate the urgency, um, but I had people telling me over and over again, "Well, they grow up fast," almost to the point that I resented it. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, I've heard that a thousand times." You know what? They were absolutely right, especially like Braxton when they start school. Say. It doesn't feel like it right now. No, it doesn't. You feel like you're spinning your wheels. Uh, but when they start school, it seems like from that point forward, it goes by so quickly. And remembering and telling yourself constantly, okay, I don't have much longer with them. Right. There's an urgency here that I need to keep in mind. And so every time I'm a little bit tired and don't really want to read the Bible with them, or I'm a little tired and we don't want to go to church the next morning, remember the consistency and constancy because I don't have long. There's there there's an urgency here that I need to that I need to establish and realize that uh, you know this is this is important and it's more important than I mean if I always thought if my child was the best soccer player or tennis player or the best you know um, uh, uh, you know trombone player or whatever it was if they were the best and yet they didn't have a strong faith what have they really succeeded at what have they really gained you know I think about a guy who can throw 99 miles an hour and makes it to the Hall of Fame and you know all that. But, I mean, he's really a failure spiritually if he, if he doesn't have a relationship with God through it all. And so I, I thought about those things. Not to say I did it perfectly by any means. Uh, I had a great spouse that helped with that. But um, that's something I always try to tell myself is that, you know, soccer can't get you to heaven, you know, no. or, or academics or anything, you know, no. like that. We, uh, we're, uh, we sure are prone to getting – our priorities upside down, aren't we? Yeah, it's easy uh, I mean, to do. Man, it's just easy to do. And I think that's why conversations like this are important. Yeah. I think that's why being around, I think that's why this multi-generational structure of the church is important. Because I need you to remind me and that it's going to go fast. Mm -hmm. And and you need me to be excited about parenting. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yes. When you're a, our, our parents of teenagers need someone saying, go, go, you got yes. this. Yes. And, and I need someone saying, hey, go, go, you got this. Yes. And, and we need the wisdom of the generations ahead of us. I mean, this is, this is truly, and I believe this, a community effort. Yeah. Um, parents are the primary influencers. Absolutely. We are placed in a spiritual community, and this is a community effort. We are in this together. God was smart when he said it. Up he this sure way. was. He's... That should go without saying. But <laughs> what a genius! Yeah. I, I mean, it, it is. It is the perfect. The perfect model. Yeah. Um, we can't lose it. We can't let culture take that away from us. I agree. And 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 culture. Satan's trying to do that at every turn with busyness. Yeah. And and priorities that don't matter. Yeah. And focuses focusing on career and money and. Sports, and sports, and sports, and sports in yeah, our culture right idol. now, mm -hmm. it's it's all over. Um, but they're good. Yeah, let's keep them in their place. They're temporary. Yeah, yeah. And but your soul, the soul of your child, is eternal. Yes. Period. Those things are temporary. Right. But you're the person, our children. Me, our children, everyone, we are eternal. Man, we, we have to remind ourselves of that all the time. I agree. So. I agree. Well, thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope that it was of some benefit. We just, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about these things. We did this last year a little bit uh, on a Sunday night. I and I think it needs to be a, a regular thing where we just talk about different ways in which we can, you know, set our kids up for spiritual success. I think all of us would agree um, that we like for our kids to succeed in other areas. I mean, that's why we pay good money for them to take hitting lessons or pitching lessons, piano lessons, whatever it is. We want the tutoring. We want them to be the best at whatever it is that they're engaging in. And certainly that's the case spiritually. 